Hello, it's Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada. I'm shooting from the Lug Nuts facility. And what we have here is uh, a really quite an interesting car uh, with a great story. And I'm gonna do a, a video presentation uh, on this car as its original owner uh, is now um, ready to let it go. It's a 2006 Spiker C8 Spider. Um, so we'll do an in-depth video. It, uh, it may go an hour, um, an hour in length. Um, I'll start out uh, by um, sort of describing what the Spiker is. You'll notice I'm wearing full Spiker uh, regalia here. Um, and, and the reason I have this is, of course, I sold these cars when they were new in Calgary in, in 2009 and 2010 and uh, attended all the product launches uh, where um, the vehicle was presented by uh, Spiker CEO uh, Victor Mueller, Mueller, Mueller. Um, and I got to actually talk to him a fair amount about the car. Um, so uh, sitting through all the technical presentations and then uh, unusually and, and, and quite, you know, quite, uh, quite in interestingly, um, you know, because uh, one doesn't get a lot of face time with uh, automotive CEOs, um, I mean, at least if you're selling cars. And so, you know, I picked up quite a bit of information about about the development of the Spiker and so on. Um, so I think I can probably add some color to the video describing um, those conversations and the gestation of the car and so forth, which I, which I was really quite uh, fascinated uh, with um, then and now. And um, we did several driving events, and including autocross, and we had it on the oval of one of the big uh, NASCAR circuits I've, and I've driven that this car quite extensively um, and uh, as well as the aileron which is just being launched in uh, 2010 okay so a bit of a bit of a background with Spiker anyway um, and I've known this car from new this is an 06 they were not importable into Canada in 06 this car actually predated the Spiker dealership in Calgary and it's uh, owned by a friend of mine um, who, who bought it new and uh, so you know after you know after uh, 16 years or so he is now ready to let it go uh, the car's only covered uh, 356 maybe I put one mile on it 357 miles um, on it so it uh, it was driven a little bit when he first got it but the problem was we couldn't register the car in Canada at the time um, so it basically became a garage ornament. It was well stored, but it just wasn't, uh, we weren't able to insure the car, register the car in Canada. So it just kind of sat there. Um, now it's 15 years old and we actually could do that. It's currently, currently has a New York title and uh, it is in Calgary now, but I've scheduled a transport to Scottsdale, Arizona, and it'll be there um, from in, uh, in mid-September. Okay, so it'll be for sale as a U.S. car with a New York title in Scottsdale, Arizona. The fact that it was in Canada, it was just uh, basically a garage ornament uh, for, the, for the first <laughs> 16 years of its life, okay? Well preserved, but um, it made the garage look nice. Um, okay, so we'll do a bit of the background on, on, on the Spiker Car Company. Of course, we, we, you know, the, the, the brand was picked up from a company that was in existence in the early part of the 20th century from around, well, uh, I guess they made carriages in the, in the 1800s and then I think went out of business in 1926. So they were an innovative uh, automobile and aircraft manufacturer in the early part of the 20th century. And then, you know, the, uh, the concept car, uh, you know, there was a concept car at an auto show in a Dutch Dutch businessman Victor Mueller pick, picked up the car and then went in search of a brand and then resurrected the Spiker brand and took some of the brand identity from the early part of the 20th century and sort of applied it to this car and then went about creating the dealer network and so on. So really quite an interesting story um, that, that, that I can go through and we can go through the history of this particular car, you know, the ownership and so on, um, which is kind of, kind of a cool story as well. Um, then we can go into the specifics of, um, you know, the, the, the content of this car. We can do a walk around video, show, I can show you, there's a couple little marks on it, so I'll, I'll show you those. Um, we had it uh, on the hoist, we did a service. So I've got a video of uh, underneath the car. We can do a paint meter reading, showing that it, it has its original paint. Um, we can do, uh, I'm gonna do a short little driving video. 
keeping in mind I can't really use the public roads in Canada, so I just kind of took it for a blast around the um, blast around the parking lot here. So uh, with all that, let's let's get started, and uh, I'll break this video into segments, and you can sort of skip ahead if you if you're already a spiker expert and you just want to see the paint meter, or or, or you want to just fast forward to the driving video or whatever. So I just put it in one video for convenience. Okay, so with that, I'll uh, turn this camera around and we will start going through this fabulous, um, fabulous 2006 Spiker C8 Spider. Okay, so let's just start uh, at the beginning here. And uh, here we have a nice book in Dutch, so I can't really translate too much of it. Um, but uh, to go through it uh, uh, very quickly, um, we have this company that would have started in 1880. They would have made uh, carriages and some really fancy car carriages for, for royalty. Um, and as with many manufacturers, when uh, the, there were the first uh, internal combustion engines by uh, Carl Benz, uh, were developed in the late uh, 1800s. They started putting those in the carriages and made their own motor cars, okay? So this is, you know, 19, 1899 or so. Um, Spiker was really quite innovative. And actually, looking through this book, uh, there are uh, some similarities with Ferdinand Porsche, who had, was also developing early cars or cars in around that time, although his cars at that time were electric. Um, so, uh, and, and also what, what I see is that there's an artistry with the Spiker, uh, with the Spiker designs that's almost uh, Bugatti-like. In other words, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, components, uh, there's, a, there's a certain elegance and art to the strictly mechanical components. Uh, which which I wouldn't say would, was characteristic of Porsche or others at the time. Um, that is actually quite rare. Like, for instance, if you look at the, the rear frame on that, it, it doesn't have to look that beautiful. It's just a structural member. And if you look at that, um, if you look at that gearbox. So there's some really lovely details. And also, uh, Spiker was fairly technically innovative coming out with the first, uh, they're credited with the first four-wheel drive vehicle. Porsche was too, and I, I guess I assume that, that that's the, because Porsche did their loner electric car with four hub-mounted electric motors giving four-wheel drive. So as near as I can tell, Spiker was the first company to do an internal combustion engine with four-wheel drive with a gearbox and transfer case. And Porsche was the first, uh, the loner Porsche was the first car to have electric four-wheel drive. Here's a fabulous picture from the 1905 Paris Expo. And, uh, you know, we see that this is a sizable a sizable um, display. And look, my goodness, look at that. Isn't that cool? Um, so, you know, we've got a, a company of some substance in the early part of the 20th century uh, with um, many models. They have racing cars. And you can see some of the... the um, the uh, uh, carriages that they developed. Okay, and then they transitioned into aircraft, and then um, and then you know it soldier on, and then in 1926 they're bankrupt, and that was it for Spiker. Okay, okay so let's fast forward now to around the year 2000. This is all from memory, so I might have, I might have some slight details wrong. And, uh, you know, at one of the international auto shows, perhaps, perhaps the one in the Netherlands, uh, there is a uh, sports car concept. It's a Dutch designer and a businessman, a Dutch businessman named Victor Mueller. I hope I have that right. It could be Mueller, I suppose, but Victor Mueller uh, sees the car on the stand and thinks, wow, that's terrific. Why don't we put that in production? Victor, among other things, I think he's trained as a lawyer, but has a clothing company, McGregor which is why Spiker had kind of the coolest uh, swag uh, of any, any uh, of manufacturers. Anyway, so he decides that's a cool, that's a cool project and they're gonna put it into production. Um, and uh, they go looking for a supply of engines and so forth. I think, I can't remember, I think BMW may have agreed to give them the engine but not the gearbox. And they said they couldn't really make it work 
because the electronic controls for the engine and the gearbox were so intertwined that they needed the, uh, the whole package. Uh, they went to Audi, and I believe they made a deal for 500 Audi uh, engine gearboxes. They were just coming out with the R8 at the time. So presumably what, what they got was the R8 transaxle and engine, although I don't quite know that for sure, uh, but uh, I'm presuming that. Um, anyway, it's a 4.2 a liter V8, uh, 400 horsepower, and then a six-speed uh, manual gearbox. Okay, so same Audi components as in the, as in the R8, and they supply that uh, engine deal. Um, there's an aluminum monocoque, and I believe that the comp there's a company in England from the Midlands that made that. The assembly uh, was in the Netherlands. Later, I think Spiker moved to the Midlands, into the UK. I'm not sure about the date on that. Anyway, so uh, Victor then starts out with this, uh, with this uh, C8. There's a, there's a coupe version, and the coupe version is the Laviolette. Uh, and then the, the, there's the Spider. So there were a lot of, a lot of concept cars uh, that they were doing. They started out with the, uh, with the C8. Um, there was the evolution of the C8, which was the Aileron, which is more of a grand touring car. Um, same engine, but with an automatic gearbox. Uh, heavier car, but more of a luxury grand tour. So that was slated to go into production around 2010. Um, there was also an SUV uh, that was the, named after Perry to Peking. Um, uh, rally that Spiker took part uh, took part in the early part of the 20th century, and that was uh, obviously a, a, a grueling uh, month-long uh, uh, expedition, basically, when there ba were basically no roads. Um, so they came out with that, and then and then since then, you know, they've had their troubles financing and 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 finding engines and so forth. And uh, there's a couple new models that are that are you know on the website, but I don't think they've made it to series production. Um, the last um, entry into their website appears to be around the um, the start of uh, COVID. So, um, and I think they had some Russian money, uh, which of course now with the Ukraine situation uh, probably isn't going that well. So we don't know much about the future of Spiker, um, but uh, in this era, uh, they, they were, you know, they, it was a serious effort. Um, they also went and, and bought, if you can believe this, an F1 team that I think was later sold to uh, Force India, and they were an entrant in Le Mans, the C8, uh, in the, uh, the GT4 class. So, and, they've, and then they bought the Saab company about 100 times their size. So, one of the most ambitious stories, um, I think, it really, you know, I'd love to read a book about, you know, all of the details, but for sure in the, in the mid 2000s, the, the, the Spiker was really sort of aggressive on the move. And Victor, um, a, a little bit about him from what he told me, he's certainly a hardcore car guy. He's a Melia, Melia entrant. He had an Invicta low chassis. He had, uh, Oh, he had a Lancia Lambda, so that was the first monocoque car in the 1920s. Some really serious old, uh, old machinery, and um, a, a really serious car collector and car guy. You know, getting into some stuff that you know the, 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 it takes a real knowledgeable enthusiast to run. You know, something like Lambda or the Invicta or what, what have you. And so we can see, you know, we can see in the Spiker some of the details like you know, the engine turn dash and so forth that comes straight out of a, like, you know, a Grand Prix Bugatti or what have you. Okay, so we have a, a serious car guy with an appreciation for uh, classic cars, for running events like the Mille Emilia, and then he sees this Dutch, you know, Dutch concept car and, 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 and puts it together. Um, they took the, I won't butcher the, um, I won't butcher the name on the, on the tailpipe here, uh, but but that is uh, for the tenacious. No road is impassable. That's the translation there. Now that's not new. That that comes from Spiker from from you know 1905 or whatever when they're doing things like the Perry to Peking rally where there aren't roads. So for the tenacious, no road is impassable. A very appropriate for a rally through Mongolia or whatever it was. Um, uh, which is how manufacturers really proved their product back then by, by partaking 
in these long, um, these long journeys. It just so happens that for the tenacious, no road is impassable is also kind of a metaphor for kind of putting out your own low volume supercar, which has got to be one of the hardest things uh, you can do. Um, as many have tried and, uh, and, 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 not, and not succeeded. And, and sadly, the spiker has to be um, in that category, although what makes spiker a little bit different is I think they really made their mark uh, with the low volume supercar you know, genre, I suppose. And I think they're really quite influential uh, well beyond uh, their production numbers. So I read that they've made 250 cars total and about 150 of the C8s and of the C8s, maybe 90 of the Roadsters, Sp Spiders, and then 60 of the Laviolettes. They had a, a Le Mans version of, of, the, of, the, of the coupe as well. And they made all kinds of different concept cars. I'm not sure if they made 250 total and 150 of the C8s, I'm not sure what those other hundred are because I don't think any of the other cars were made in anything close to series production. I, I mean, they're just made handfuls of, of each of them. So I'd, I'd like to know the breakup of those extra hundred cars and they, that those might be development cars or cars that were crashed or, you know, different show cars or whatever. I don't know, but I don't, I, I don't think Spiker made any quantity of anything else other than a C8, okay? To the best, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, so um, now why would Spiker have made a mark, uh, you know, with the Koenigsegg and Paganis and Nobles and Ariel Adams and Caterhams and Marcoses and, you know, all the other, all the other, uh, you know, all those other low volume cars. What would Spiker have done? Like, what, why is this a significant car um, compared to all of those? And what's my, what's my take on that? Well, I think, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll digress a little bit and, and just go back into what this car is. And, you know, it's an aluminum monocoque, um, pressed, uh, you know, aluminum sheets, so welded, welded together with, uh, with structural, you know, structural elements. I'm not sure if they're welded up or extruded or a combination of both of them, but basically an aluminum monocoque. Um, inboard, uh, inboard suspension, uh, front and rear, with uh, bell cranks on it, so similar to, you know, similar to a, ra a race car. Rose jointed or spherical bearing uh, suspension, uh, suspension items, okay, like a race car. So an aluminum monocoque, inboard rear suspension, uh, you know, upper and, and lower A-arms for the suspension, uh, rows jointed together for, you know, the different components. Well, that's all race car, you know, out of the 1960s, late 60s, early 70s, and up until, you know, they started using carbon fiber in carbon fiber monocoques in the early 80s, okay? So it's a, it's like a 60s or 70s sports racing car. That would be, like, that would be what the construction is. Mid-engine, gearbox in the rear, um, you know, big brakes. What, this car is unusual in that it has virtually no, well, it doesn't have any electronic nanny. So there's no traction control, no stability control. There's no brake booster. Um, there's no ABS. So another car like that would be a McLaren F1. That was another driver's car uh, with a huge emphasis on weight saving from Gordon Murray that didn't have any driving aids either. So the Spiker is similar to that. The, the McLaren F1 is a carbon fiber body and this has an aluminum monocoque, but the McLaren isn't, isn't that much lighter. Um, I think a test weight on an F1 is still 3,000 pounds. I think they list the curb weight at 2,500 and I think the curb weight on this is about 2,800. So it's not much heavier than a McLaren F1, okay? Um, it, certainly with the Audi V8 engine and 2,800 pounds and, uh, you know, normally aspirated and lots of torque, the thing's properly fast. There's no question about that. And lots of low-end torque. You don't even have to use more than three, 4,000 RPM and the thing just goes. Okay, but let me digress. So it's constructed basically like a race car from the 60s or 70s. All right, so... You know, a race car for the road, that's been done. There's lots of companies that have tried to make race cars for the road. 
Um, and how does the spiker, how does the spiker differ than that? Well, it differs in that it's a race car for the road, but look at the interior. I mean, I mean, it's, it's entirely all quilted leather. We've got this wonderful exposed uh, gear lever. Um, we have the engine turn dash, the, the you know, the billet, um, you know, vents and switches and toggles. It's all, it's all aluminum. It's all really wonderfully tactile. It's like, it looks like a, like a, I mean, I joke that a, that a spiker is a cross between a Ford GT40 and a Chanel handbag. Like it, it, Spiker was the first post-war sports car that I can think of that would have taken, you know, this, this artistry to the interior to make, you know, to make it bejeweled, to turn the each button and switch into kind of like a tactile pleasure, to really pay attention to kind of every surface. Since then, other companies have really picked that up. We see that in a Pagani. Uh, where, you know, the, the mirrors look like leafs and the, and the, you know, crazy, crazy attention to detail. We see that in the Singer, you know, every little bit of that. Like, there's a lot of, if you go look at the luggage compartment of a Singer and, the, and, and this car, you know, you, you think that, you know, at least partly they were influenced by, the, by this car. So I think, I think that what the Spiker did is they were the first car company post-war to really uh, to really pay a lot of attention to, to, to tactile uh, switches and uh, and like you know the, the, the jewelry inside the car and so forth like that pre-war that was relatively common if you go look in the cockpit of a Mercedes SSK or a Tavo Lego or something like that you know every little bit of it is basically you know a little beautiful sculpture or a little kind of object to art okay um, with mass production of course that kind of went away and I think Spiker was the first person first company sorry uh, uh, to really put that back in a car and I think that was pretty influential okay so I think I think combining this race car for the road with this kind of object to art is spiker was probably the first post-war to do that so that's i think something that was quite significant um and you know you might look at this car and and just think okay well this is you know this is just uh you know a show pony or something like that but no, the car went to le mans i mean it placed reasonably well 80 percent of the lap is is full throttle Talking to Victor about it, it was incredibly difficult. He said that every bit of that car wants to catch on fire. I mean, it's it's the it's incredibly difficult to survive a 24-hour race, and and they made you know a, ver a version, a close version of, of this car do it. So that you know it's got serious you know serious um, you know racing chops, and if it was a crappy car, it would not be able to do that. Okay, it just wouldn't. So it's not only a racing car for the road. It's a racing car that could go to Le Mans, and that's a pretty short list. Of course, the McLaren F1 um, won its, uh, you know, it was, it was built as a road car, and then they couldn't sell them, and then they made a couple, some racing cars out of that, and then they took the racing car to Le Mans, and in fact, it did win its first time out. So the McLaren F1 is another, you know, road car that went to Le Mans, and that one won. But I think a McLaren F1 right now is like $25 million. Um, you, know, the, uh, you know, the Ferraris and the Porsches also have a long history of doing the same thing. But, um, you know, they have a lot of practice. I mean, for a new manufacturer to come out, build a brand new car, and have it be able to do that is a tremendous accomplishment, okay? And a real credit to the engineers. So the Spiker C8 is not just a showpiece. It, it, is, it, can, it can be a showpiece. It, it's a wonderful showpiece. The car really stops everybody in their tracks. Um, but it's also, it's also got, you know, the, the depth of engineering to it. Now, um, driving the car, um, you've got a lightweight car, 2,800 pounds or something, um, uh, a lot of torque out of a 4.2 normally aspirated V8 engine, manual gearbox. Uh, the ratios are pretty short. Um, there is a pretty big difference between the front and the rear track. Let's just scoot over here. 
um, and the front track is quite a bit narrower. Um, and uh, what this means is the car is really pointy on the nose um, and it's got lots of torque uh, from the engine. What that means is that the tail just wants to go out and it is super fun. Um, it's a great autocross car. And later in the video, I did a short video blasting around the parking lot. Um, and, uh, you know, at reasonable speeds, um, like, you know, 30 miles an hour, um, you can have an absolute blast in this car. You don't have to, you don't have to risk your neck and your driver's license to do it just because it, uh, it, it always wants, the tail always wants to come out. There's no traction control. Steering ratio is really quick. Uh, no, the nose is really pointy. Suspension, you know, the rose jointed suspension components is really sharp and it makes a great noise and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's terrific fun. Um, added to that, you know, you can see the windshield here. Um, you know, there's no, um, uh, there's no top rail on the windshield, which means the, the, the demarcation from, you know, the windshield to the sky isn't really there. So it really, you really feel open uh, to the elements. And then the uh, and then the exhaust doesn't have a lot doesn't have very far to go, um, you know it's basically like only 24 inches or something uh, from the back of the engine. Interestingly, on this car it has the the sport exhaust. So what you're looking at now is the the is the sport exhaust that basically is a straight pipe to the catalytic converters in the engine. Um, if we go down. Um, under the diffuser, um, we can see, if I can get this for you here, we can see those pipes right there, and that is when the exhaust bypasses the sport exhaust, goes through the muffler, and exits at the bottom of the diffuser. So that's a completely different noise, um, but when you hit the sport exhaust on the toggle, you just get this blast right from the uh, rear of the car. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's a very uh, visceral machine. I likened it to, I don't know if anybody listening to this ever listened to the Ramones, but, you know, punk rock band, and it, I likened it to having a quadruple espresso and listening to the Ramones. It's, it's super fun and super engaging. Um, so, okay, so that's what a spiker is. It, it, you know, it's, it's, like I said, a cross between a sports racing car and a, and a super luxury item um, that's kind of unique. I, I can't, I don't know of another car like that. I suppose a Bugatti uh, Chiron or Veyron would, would have an interior similar to that, but it's more of a grand touring car, not an outright sports car. So th this car is a lightweight, almost like a go-kart with a Bugatti Veyron interior in it. This is really quite a unique uh, combination. Um, not the most practical thing in the world, uh, you know, but, but, but you, but you know that. Okay. Okay. And then other recollections from my conversations with Victor. Um, so overall it, it was a hardcore car, car guy with a long history of doing events like the Amelia Amelia and uh, varied interests in really significant cars. You know, Lancia Lambda was a very significant car in the 1920s, the first monocoque construction, narrow angle V engine, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, real hard hardcore, knowledgeable and experienced um, enthusiast and collector, okay. Um, about, you know, I remember a couple of these seminars about the gestation of a car and just how hard it is, just how hard making your own car is. And I don't think anybody thinks that's easy but it's incredibly difficult, uh, all the regulatory challenges and so forth, and just the investment. Like I think, uh, this is from memory, but I, I, I think he told us that, you know, the, the headlight assembly was like a million dollars to like make a headlight. You know, it was crazy, crazy uh, expensive. And the, uh, you know, the crash testing and all those kind of regulations and so on. It, it really, it's a miracle anybody can get that done independently. Like it is really tough. So. And then there was long conversations about, you know, what it takes to actually enter Le Mans and to, and to survive that race and just how difficult that was uh, for, for, you know, for, for the team and the company and so on and all the development they put in the car. And uh, if anybody thinks that's easy, <laughs> just listening to him talk about just how challenging that is was certainly 
an eye-opening um, experience. Um, and you know, we went on to, to t talk about you know <laughs> different markets and and how they you know and you know how they how they differed uh, and, so, and so on and how the cars were sold in different markets and. Um, Let's just say that some of the emerging markets were <laughs> a little bit more challenging than the, the North America. So uh, all in all, I think you know my my conversations with him about about you know some some of the old cars he had, and uh, you know it, it actually from that conversation I started getting interested in Lancia, which, which is a whole you know a great uh, a great uh, great reading, and uh, you know I, I really enjoyed talking to him. And uh, he actually was quite influential and in sort of broadening my horizons a little bit. So I have to credit him for that. And uh, you know, the, he he really took the dealer network seriously. He wanted to really train all the salespeople and took a lot of his own personal time to go go you know tell the story. But you know, I've sold lots of different cars, and the CEO never came and talked to us. Okay, so that was that was quite unusual. You know, he. He wanted us to experience, you know, the the luxury lifestyle. So he actually flew us down to, I don't know, Alabama or wherever on a private jet to go to, you know, to, you know, to experience that and put us up in nice hotels and and uh, you know we drove these things on the banking on one of the big NASCAR tracks. We we did a timed solo like a, a autocross event. Can you imagine? You know, a bunch of car salesmen um, timing them and letting them loose <laughs> in three hundred thousand dollar cars. Um, we won, of course, um, but uh, uh, you know, he just approached it with a whole lot more seriousness um, and uh, thoughtfulness and so on about getting the staff trained and the dealer network set up and everything for the car. Uh, there were lots of spiker events and lots of technical seminars and so on. So that, uh, that was super fun. And I certainly um, remember those days uh, fondly uh, even if we didn't sell that many cars. Okay, so um, it's a quality piece. It's well engineered. It's fun to drive. It's rare. It's unusual. It's it's, it's really a great car. Um, looks great. Great conversation piece. But m mostly, it's just it's super fun to drive. So one of the things I thought was really interesting about the branding of the car is that Victor Mueller thought it was really important to you know give this uh, concept car some heritage and some DNA and some brand values. And that is a little bit unusual because, you know, if you were, you know, Koenigsegg, you just called yourself, you called your car Koenigsegg. Or if you were, you know, Pagani, you just called your car a Pagani. Or you were a Roof, you just called yourself, your car a Roof or whatever it was. So, but Victor really wanted to create a brand. And that's why he went looking for, you know, um, that's why he resurrected the old, Spiker Car Company, uh, because he wanted some history, he wanted some memories, he wanted some brand values, and and that's where the you know the aircraft, um, you know the motif and the propeller and so forth comes from was was Spiker's early aviation history, and so he felt that if he could sort of ground the sports car with some history and resurrect a brand and uh, create some brand values around that, that that uh, you know he'd be better able to market and sell the car. That combined with really establishing and putting a lot of effort into the dealer network, selecting the dealers, training the uh, you know the salespeople, you know inviting them out to track days, letting them experience the cars, letting them sit in on fairly technical briefings, which you know normally you just get watered down stuff uh, from the manufacturers. So there there was a whole lot of effort to you know, not just create a sports car, but to create a brand around it, and then to fill that out with, you know, with GT cars and SUVs, and, uh, you know, there was a, a, um, a, v, a less expensive V6 car, uh, et cetera. So it, it, I, th I thought that the whole, the whole effort was really well done, really committed, really, um, really well thought out, um, you know, it just in, in 09 and, and 2010, those were great years. I mean, we were discounting Astons and Bentleys. I mean, you know, if somebody wanted to buy our Bentley, you know, Azure, you know, $450,000 convertible, we'd have given you a $150,000 discount. 
we were selling DBSs for a fifty thousand dollar discount. Uh, Aston Martin DBSs. Um, you know, it, uh, we're selling Bentleys for yeah, like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars off MSRP. So th those weren't easy years uh, for us selling selling those cars, and the luxury market was probably a little bit saturated for the amount of buyers at that time. So the timing was a little bit off, and uh, you know, you can you can you know, hypothesize whether buying an F1 team was a good idea or not, etc. cetera. Um, but I thought that overall, the conceptually, the product, the, the launch, the preparation of the dealer network, the after-sales support, there was good, good people working there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 it's a shame there's no new spikers. It kind of was a, a mark that deserved to succeed. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the prices of used spikers have risen quite quite dramatically. I mean, we couldn't get 300 grand for ours in the showroom at the time, um, but now, you know, the car's probably worth double that, um, in the Canadian dollars. Uh, so I think people are now recognizing kind of the significance of, of a car. And, you know, there's no way you could build this car for today for half a million dollars. So, you know, I think that there's there's value there. And, you know, plus it's great, great looking car, great sort of object and a lot of fun to drive too. So anyway, I enjoyed my days with Spiker and, uh, you know, feel quite, uh, well, quite, uh, uh, you know, proud to have been associated with the, uh, with the brand and, and also to, uh, to represent uh, this car. Okay, well, the car looks pretty good. Um, I don't think, anybody would be disappointed about the condition. It doesn't have any miles on it, only has I think 357 miles on it. I think I put one mile on it uh, and it had 356 from the first owner. Um, there are a couple of marks on it, which I will point out, and they would be kind of the only things that would um, uh, you know, differentiate it from like a brand new car, okay? So let's just go through those. The only one of real significance was something that happened to the door and it got a ping in the door right beneath the handle, okay? So I haven't tried to pull that out or do anything with that. So that's that's the only one real kind of mark on the car. Um, if we go around, there were a couple little tiny chips which uh which i touched up so two of them right there okay and then there was also a little chip that was down there i don't know maybe from a seatbelt or something and we touched that up okay um, okay so if we look under the front spoiler it's all pretty good um you know if you feel down there you know, there's a couple of little abrasions, okay? But otherwise, and you can see more of the underneath of the car in the undercarriage section of the video, okay? But there are, there's a couple little marks underneath that. Um, you, you have to lie down and get a phone underneath the car to see it, but, but they're there. Okay. Um, uh, the wheels, uh, three of them are perfect. Uh, I did notice... There was a mark on this wheel. Uh, the date, everybody always wants to know about date codes on tires, and they would be uh, 2606, so that's the 26th week of 2006, which makes sense considering I think the car was built in August of 2006. Okay, so, any other flaws in the car? Um, no. Uh, the interior shows it new. There's no staining or rips or discolor discoloration uh, anywhere in the leather or the dash. Um, it's been it's been stored in a climate controlled garage, as you might expect. Uh, there's no shrinkage of the leather. Um, Calgary's dry, um, so you know from the same household. Uh, I got a, a Volvo that hadn't been driven in 15 years 
a um, uh, an XJS that hadn't been driven in 15 years, uh, and this car as well. Um, and uh, you know, we did, we didn't really have to do anything to any of the cars. This car we did an oil service on it, but it's not like climates with a high uh, high humidity, where um, you know the brake brake fluid or the coolant uh, is contaminated. That, that said, you could you know we you could change the brake fluid if you wanted to, um, but um, we just did the oil and the oil that came out of it was perfect, okay? So it's been well stored mechanically. Um, it does not need anything mechanically. There was one, when, when we tried to revive it, it wouldn't start, it wouldn't start. We diagnosed it with the fuel, uh, the fuel pumps um, and they had seized um, from uh, non-use. So it was a little bit of a, a job to replace those. Um, but that, that, that was done cleanly. The, sil the fuel tanks li live in the sills, kind of underneath where it says spiker. Um, and uh, so we had to, um, you know, tilt the rear bodywork back and then pull out the fuel tanks and then replace the, um, the, the fuel pumps in those tanks. Um, so we did that job. So it has, it has fresh fuel. Um, and then uh, that did trigger a check engine light uh, which is part of the uh, emission control system. Uh, and in the manual, it uh, tells you that the car needs three cycles of being driven. And it's quite specific that it's, uh, you know, stop and go traffic and highway traffic and, you know, driving it for a half an hour at a time and so on. So I haven't done that yet. And so that check engine light is still there. That's not the, you know, service the engine light. It's just the check engine light for the fuel system. And again, the manual gives a process for getting, uh, for turning that out. And it's just that I didn't want to put the miles on the car to be able to do that. So it, it runs perfectly, but uh, that light uh, is on. Okay, so that's one, one disclosure. Um, the only other thing I can think of uh, with the car is that these struts um, hold the doors, like there's struts in the doors which hold it up, hydraulic struts, um, and they do, and, and they're fine. Um, they would have been stronger when they were new, and so when you hit the release, uh, it would have sprung the door up by itself, uh, and the struts aren't uh, strong enough, 15 years old, to do that, so you have to lift the doors up. So that's the only other little thing. Uh, that I noticed with the car. Otherwise, it is as new. Um, so, uh, you know, the potential buyers are, well, just the audience anyway, is, is gonna wonder, well, why would anybody buy this car and then only put 360 miles on it in 15 years? Why would, why would you do that? Well. Uh, what happened was the story on this car was that it was bought at the, or the order was taken at the Monaco Boat Show. Um, and it was a, a Dutch businessman uh, that uh, met Victor Mueller and it was a Dutch car. So I think that, that was kind of the reason that it was purchased just because it was Dutch. And um, obviously it was a neat car too. So it couldn't have been imported into Canada because it didn't have an airbag. And so the owner had a residence in New York and so it was, it was, it was titled in New York and it has New York plates. Um, but then it came to Calgary. It was run in Calgary briefly on New York plates, um, but then to re-register it, it would have had to gone back to New York uh, and uh, they would have had to, they would have had to see it to smog it or whatever they do and he just never bothered, okay? So it just, it basically just stayed in his basement um, uh, for 15 years and uh, he was happy to have it. Um, but then I think the, 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 the family just went through, um, you know, just some, just some cleaning up of some stuff and they had all these cars that were never driven. So if you look at my bat history, there's a Maserati uh, there's a, a Volvo P1800 and some other really low mileage cars, and a couple of those are from the same, the same the XJS, uh, or from the same household, and they were just you know thinning down their collection and, and, and selling some stuff that they just never drove. Okay, so that 
that was the story about this car. It would have been driven more if it was legal to register and drive in Canada, which it had never has been, okay? And so it actually could be now because it's 15 years old, just. Uh, so, so we could actually plate it and register it and insure it in Canada. Um, but, uh, but he's decided to let the car go. So it's a, again, it's a, it's a US car um, on, uh, on New York plates with a New York title with its original owner. Uh, it's not a show and display car. The, it didn't have an airbag, but there is an exemption for that. And actually the exemption for not having the airbag on the spiker is the same, almost the same sticker on that Tesla Roadster as well. So both those cars were able to be, uh, got an exemption from the NHTSA to not have an airbag. Okay. So, uh, I will do uh, a quick walk around of the car, just so you can see all the panels. And then we can paint meter it, just to verify that it's got its original, uh, original paint on it, um, which I can do shortly. But uh, let's just pan around the car and I'll show you all the different panels. There's no chips in the windscreen. What is it? It's the dust. Um, some might ask why it doesn't have the sort of propeller fuel cap, and I think that came in in, um, in 2009. Uh, it wasn't on the early cars, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Okay, let's get the paint meter out and we'll go through the car with the paint meter. Okay, so the, uh, this paint meter reads in micrometers and so that is one one thousandth of a millimeter and so 211 would be then 0.2 of a millimeter uh, and that's about what you'd expect on a new car, although, you know, a hand-built car, you might, you might give it a little bit more, a um, little bit more leeway uh, just because there's more hand you know it's not painted by a robot like a new Perseid, a mercedes or a porsche or something so um, you know what you're looking for is big variations you know more than more than uh, a tenth of a millimeter or so um,
This is a little thicker than, uh, as, as you'd expect, a little bit thicker than you'd have with a, with a, with a high volume car, but it's still, you know, it's still all within 150 uh, micrometers or so. What, you know, what you're looking for is it, it going from, you know, 200 to, you know, 1200 or something. And depending on how it's sprayed, you know, the paint will sit in different, different places on the body work differently. Um, and sometimes you get rogue amounts just by the way this is sitting. If I don't have the meter square to the uh, body work. It is worthwhile using this before you polish too though, because it'll tell you how much paint you have to work with. Sometimes with collector cars, they can get over polished. So it looks like on this door, for instance, it's a little bit thinner. So you'd want to be, you know, you wouldn't want to use an aggressive compound I mean, 150 mil, uh, micrometers is still lots, but if you get it down to 50 or 60 or something, you need to be you need to be pretty careful. It's not right. Okay, so I hope, I hope that uh, satisfies um, any, any, uh, any inquiries as to whether it has the original paint or not, uh, and it does, um, and those are the paint meter reports. So I think we'll go and have a close look at the interior now, and then go underneath the car. Okay, and uh, this is certainly one of the highlights of the car. We can see the... Uh, the gorgeous um, turned aluminum dash and you know everything that looks like metal is of course metal um, there's no plastic in this car at all and it's all bespoke so none of these none of these gauges um, or knobs are from anything else and you can just see how beautifully uh, turned out uh, everything is and they have a really nice uh, you know tactile sense about them um, the um, you know, the, I think this is the first instance of a exposed gear lever, at least at least uh, as a design element. And uh, then there's a then there's a button on the top, and that's the solenoid that controls the solenoid to lock out reverse. It's important to press that and not just jam it. Try to jam it into reverse because you can twist the um, the linkage uh, uh, and and mess up the linkage if you do that. So you always want to press that button and then it easily, it easily goes into reverse, okay? Um, not the easiest car to get in and out of. And if you're not that uh, limber, you know, it is, would be possible to damage some of the leather. Uh, and we can see that um, it's, it's, it looks brand new, of course. And there's no marks on the carpet. Um, you can see the gorgeous, uh, gorgeous pedal box beautiful piece there and no shrinkage of the leather on the dash I, I think I wrote in a column once that it didn't have a demister but I, I, I just didn't see it it's got a, it does have a demister on the front there uh, okay and uh, the soft top arrangement is a little bit tent like and you wouldn't accuse the car of being waterproof <laughs> um, but then it doesn't have this uh, it doesn't have a 
a top rail uh, on the side windows or the windscreen. So you really, um, you really get a, uh, there's no demarcation from the, the glass to the sky. So it's a really quite a special experience. Um, anyway, the interior is flawless. Okay. And you can see all of, you know, all of this beautiful alloy work. And, uh, you know, you spend all your waking hours polishing this car. Uh, and it's a real, a real pleasure. Okay. So let's go now to, we'll put this car on the hoist and we'll have a look underneath the car. Uh, and then we can um, take it for a drive. So we've got this Spiker C8 Spider uh, up on the lift right now. And so let's just do a video of the undercarriage with only 360 miles on it total. Uh, you would uh, expect it to look uh, new uh, underneath and, and it does. Um, uh, that said, it was driven a couple times. And so we did, uh, we did clean up the, um, we did clean up the, uh, the bottom of it and wipe it all down for you. Um, so the aluminum on this car isn't uh, coated. Um, so uh, it will oxidize and uh, stain um, if you don't keep polishing it. So we gave the aluminum a little bit of a polish and we see the uh, front spoiler is in pretty good shape. It's a pretty vulnerable piece. And, you know, there's a couple little tiny marks on it, um, on the spoiler. Um, of course, it's only visible from three inches away underneath the car. On the top, it looks, uh, it looks perfect. Okay, but it is there. Um, there's under trays. These are aluminum under trays that are painted. Um, and uh, they're, you know, of course, undented, and the car's been jacked up in all the proper places, so there's no undercarriage damage from any of that. And all the fasteners are in good shape. Um, we cleaned up the, you know, the inside of the wheels and wiped down the suspension and so forth, and it all looks brand new. There's no, um, well, it, it, it looks like a new car. Okay. So just traveling back here. Uh, and then we've got the, this is, this is raw aluminum and then this is painted. And uh, we can see the NACA ducts back there and it's all in nice shape. And again, we, uh, we wipe down all the suspension pieces inside. And there's actually a surprising amount of aluminum to polish this car. <laughs> Spiker takes about three days to wash. <laughs> okay, and then I can give you a shot of the wheels as well. Which are free of any blemishes. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful machine in that, in that it's all, it's a real nuts and bolts car. And anything that looks like metal is metal. Um, so you can, you know, you can, it was built by hand. So even if you, even if you have to, even if you have to, if you need a piece of some sort, it was built by hand once. So you can, you can make it again by hand. Um, but uh, it, it really is a pleasure to, uh, to clean this car up just because you get, just to get, just to get the, um, you know, to see all the, the lovely details of it. Okay. So anyway, the under, underneath of the car looks as you might expect a car uh, that's only been driven 350 kilometers. There's no damage um, or otherwise any issues with it, but still it is nice to see. And uh, it really is a pretty car underneath as well as on top and inside. And it's just the kind of car that you, I mean, there's not very many cars with aluminum under trays. I mean, most of the, you know, anything that's a Porsche or something like that uh, is, is, you know, is going to be plastic. Um, so it's nice to, it's nice to uh, get underneath this car and have a look at the construction methods. 
It really, it, it really reminds me of a, of a 60s or a 70s sports racing car, which would have, you know, basically the same thing of aluminum monocoque, aluminum, aluminum belly pans, NACA ducks, et cetera, et cetera. You know, looking at underneath, you'd think it would be, you'd think it was a Ford GT40 or something like that. So anyway, there you go. We'll move on to the next section of the video, but uh, undercarriage of this car is extremely clean. Um, you know, if, if it weren't upside down, you could eat off it. We've got, this car has an Audi wiring harness and it has an Audi key. So we need to reach in the glove box and turn on the key. And that, and that provides power to the uh, electrical system. We have this aircraft style uh, toggle switch, we lift that up. Um, we have uh, a toggle underneath that, flip it up. And then we've got a push button start. And this, uh, Okay, so this brings us to the end of my presentation on the 2006 Spiker C8 uh, Spider. Um, I hope that uh, there's some information in there that you found interesting. And if you're a prospective buyer, I hope that you found the um, presentation uh, thorough. Um, you know, what is a Spiker? Well, it's kind of like a cross between a 
Ford GT40 and a Chanel handbag. What's it like to drive? Well, it's kind of like drinking a quadruple shot of espresso and listening to the Ramones. It functions as a, you know, just a visceral thrill. It, uh, it functions as a, you know, an object to art. Sit in your living room if you wanted to. It's a great uh, conversation piece for, for, for coffee and cars. Um, you know, what it isn't is, you know, transportation in any, <laughs> any meaningful sense. It's, a, it's um, you could probably call it an A to A car instead of an A to B car. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's optimized for, you know, a short, uh, invigorating blast, not necessarily, um, long distance touring, but, but you knew that, um, this car, you know, is one of about 90 Spiker C8, uh, spiders, you know, not many of them of high mileage, but, uh, you know, 357 miles on this. It, Maybe the the lowest mileage one extant. I, I suppose there could be one with with less miles than this, but uh, there can't be very many if that's the case. Um, and it is in virtually uh, new condition. Um, again, the car is a uh, titled in New York. Uh, it will be resting uh, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, waiting waiting the uh, completion of an auction and uh, sale. Um, uh, it comes with the car cover, the servicing, the oil change has just been done. Uh, we have uh, cleaned and polished it um, underneath and on top and in the side. And uh, it's just ready, ready to go and ready to, to be enjoyed and admired. You know, it's a really delightful car in its details. And I think it's significant because I think a lot of, uh, it influenced a lot of other manufacturers like Singer and Pagani and so forth, and just making, you know, the inside of the car, you know, just driving the car more, you know, of an event. And, um, you know, it does great numbers. It's, you know, zero to 60 in four seconds, 180 miles an hour, and it's a fast car and it's a blast to drive and so on. But other cars are fast too, and some, you know, new cars are faster. But in terms of just, in just the visceral pleasure, the tactile pleasure, ambiance of the cabin, the, the, uh, you know, the lack of the top rail on the windscreen, the whole experience driving it. I mean, it, it, it's really in a kind of a league of its own, you know, and, and all, of the, all of this can be explored without going 200 miles an hour. Like this can all be explored at, you know, 30 miles an hour in second gear. You don't, you don't need to break the law necessarily to enjoy the car. So there's a lot to be said for it. And, uh, it's a wonderful piece and thrilled to have some time with it and uh, thrilled to be a part of the Spiker history a little bit in, in 09 and 2010. And uh, I hope, hope it finds a, a new appreciative uh, custodian and who knows, maybe we'll see another Spiker one day. Thank you very much. Please like and subscribe. Lawrence Romanowski from Calgary, Canada, shooting from the Lugnuts facility until the next video.